Thank you all for inviting me today. Uh, and Brian and I are going to have a, a Q&A session after some brief remarks that I give here. We're going to do a Q&A amongst the two of us, but then we're going to turn to all of you. You know, it's really important for me. So I'm the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, have been president since January of 2016. I always like to start by explaining why I'm here and what the Federal Reserve does. A lot of people don't understand. The Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. So Congress created the Federal Reserve System in 1913. And our jobs are to try to manage some of the ups and downs of the U.S. economy to keep stable growth and maximum employment. And the reason why it's important that I'm here to hear from all of you is there's something unique about our nation's central bank. So if you go back in American history, Brian talked about Alexander Hamilton. He actually created the first central bank in the United States called the Bank of the United States. It lasted about 20 years. And then Congress got rid of it. Then they created another central bank, and then they got rid of it. And then our economy, especially the ag economy, was hammered by banking crises in the late 1800s. And America basically always said, we don't like the idea of having a central bank because it sounds nefarious, a bunch of bankers in a dark room doing God knows what. We don't like that. But then when the US economy was hammered with banking panics and crises, Congress said, well, I guess we need to have a central bank to manage these ups and downs. But if we're going to have a central bank, we're not going to keep it all in Washington, DC, under the thumb of the government. We want to do something unique. So in 1913, Congress created what's called the Board of Governors in Washington, DC, and 12 independent regional Federal Reserve Banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So they did that because they wanted all the regions of the country to be directly represented in economic and monetary policy making. So at the Minneapolis Fed, our jobs are literally to represent all of you. So our region includes Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. So a big part of my job is to get out around our region and hear directly from constituents what's happening in your economy, what's happening in your businesses or on your farms, are you able to find workers, what's happening to wages, what's happening to prices, so that I can take this information back with me when I go back to Washington, D.C. every six weeks when we set interest rates for the nation. So the reason I'm here, and I'm excited to be here, is because I'm here happy to tell you what we're working on at the Federal Reserve, but I'm really interested in hearing from you. What's happening in your markets? What's happening in the ag sector around our region so that I can be more informed when I go back to Washington, D.C.? And that's why when I give talks like this, I set aside most of the time for Q&A so I can hear directly from you. You can ask me anything you'd like, but I'd also love to hear what you're seeing, what you're experiencing. And some of my colleagues from the Minneapolis Fed are here and have been attending the conference, hearing from the other speakers as well. So the one ask that I have for you is don't be shy. I always tell people, ask me your toughest question or give me your toughest comment, because that's, that's how I'm going to learn the most. So don't be Minnesota nice. Uh, just uh, give it to me straight, and I'll be able to learn as much as I can from you. So some of the things that I know you've been talking about today, I know trade is a big topic of uh, enormous concern to the ag sector. Uh, I'll just give you a few thoughts on it. I know Brian and I are going to talk about it, and we'll hear more from you. you know, I'm sympathetic overall with the need to be tough on China. I've observed, I was in Washington uh, as part of the Bush administration and briefly under the Obama administration. My old boss, Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, had an intensive engagement with China. One of the things that I've learned is that 20 years of having serious conversations with China, China smiles and nods, and then they do whatever they were going to do anyway. So 20 years of very serious conversations hasn't led to, any, hasn't led to much. So there, we need to explore other ways of holding China account to actually have fair trade. So I'm sympathetic with the need to push China to open their markets and to have fair trade. I deeply believe that free trade has benefited the US economy tremendously over our history. It's enormously important going forward. <clears throat> and there are real pain, there's real pain being felt right now, especially in the ag sector. But I'm also sympathetic with, we do need to find a way to open markets around the world so that we have fair trade for US producers and for U.S. consumers on a long-term basis. And so I'm sympathetic with that, though it's not a strategy without cost and without risks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turning to uh, monetary policy, which I'm sure many people here are going to have opinions about and interest in, the, the Federal Reserve has been raising rates for the past few years. 
I've been pretty outspoken saying I don't see the need to raise rates. So we have this thing called a dual mandate. One of our goals is stable prices. So inflation at 2%, that's how we define stable prices. Another goal is maximum employment. As many Americans who want to work are able to find jobs. And those two goals, stable prices and maximum employment, we traditionally think are linked through wages. So as, as the economy heats up and businesses have to compete to find workers, you typically think businesses now have to bid up wages and then that leads to inflation. So as the job market gets tighter, you would think that that leads to higher inflation over time. Well, one thing that's really surprised us over the past few years, as the US economy has gotten stronger and more and more Americans have come into the job market and the headline un unemployment rate has fallen, now down to 3.7%, which is quite low historically, the big surprise for us, it hasn't led to much wage growth. Wages have picked up a little bit, but in the context of history, wage growth has not picked up very much, and it is not yet at a level that signals high inflation to come. So that means that there's been more slack in the labor market than we have appreciated. Traditionally, that headline unemployment rate was a pretty good measure of how much slack there is, and with the unemployment rate at 3.7%, you would think we must be at full employment. But that 3.7% number only includes people who are actively looking for work. If people gave up looking because of the Great Recession, they weren't counted in that number. So we've been pleasantly surprised when the US economy has continued to create about 200,000 jobs a month, month after month after month, as more and more Americans enter the job market. So that's enormously positive for those workers, enormously positive for their families and for their communities. And the big question that we're wrestling with is, how many more are out there? Are there a lot more workers who would re-enter the job market if wage growth picked up? And so this is the debate that we continue to have at the Federal Reserve, and we don't know for sure. I mean, I wish we did know. I wish we knew exactly how much slack was left. We just don't know. And I've been in the camp saying, hey, let's take it easy on rate increases to allow the job market to continue to strengthen. And if we see signs of inflation picking up or inflation expectations picking up, we can always raise rates then. And so far, I continue to think that that's uh, an appropriate stance. But me and my colleagues are all focused on looking at the data, seeing how the economy actually evolves. So I'd be interested in hearing from you what you all are seeing. I know many farmers and many folks in the ag sector struggle to find workers. What are you doing? How are you responding? Are you, in fact, raising wages? You know, a lot of businesses that I meet with say, boy, it's so tough, we just can't find the workers we need. And then I say, well, have you tried raising wages? And often the answer is no. That's the last thing that they want to do. Increasingly, you do hear anecdotes of businesses saying, yeah, we are paying more now. And the good news is I often hear about it at lower end workers, lower skilled entry level workers. Their wages tended to have lagged in this recovery. It's nice that they're now starting to get some pay increases. But if you look at the aggregate wage data, the aggregate inflation data, we're not yet seeing signs of an economy that's overheating or inflation about to take off. But these are the signals that we're trying to figure out as we're determining the future path of monetary policy. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about trade. I talked a little, bit about, a little bit about monetary policy. What I think I'd like to do now is invite Brian to come out here. We're gonna have a discussion and then we're gonna open it up to all of you. Uh, I think you can uh, send in questions electronically as well as we're gonna have roving mics. So again, don't hold back. I'd love to hear directly from you. Both your comments and your questions are welcome. So why don't you come on out, Brian? Thank you for those remarks. And I will uh, emphasize, I'll put this, uh, your ask for questions and input. Um, as you all know, President Trump has been very active in giving the Fed uh, recommendations. <laughs> you have the same opportunity to do that today is the way I look at it. So I hope you'll take advantage of that and do raise questions. And as he said, you can both step to a microphone at any time. This is not meant, uh, you'll get to listen to me left, less if you walk to the <coughs> microphone. Um, so do walk the microphone, and then again, those tents that are on your table have the website that you can, uh, can chime in on. And, but, but I will take the license of sitting here, and my first question, you talked about, about trade, and as I was listening about trade, I was thinking one of the elements that hasn't come up yet is foreign direct investment. And it just happened this morning that, of course, one of our local firms has been purchased by a South Korean company, 
If we look at our meat processing, meat packing sectors, we look at many of our grain sectors and so on, a lot of foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment is coming into the U.S. Um, you know, how should we view that in agriculture? I mean, we, somebody this morning talked about money flows. Uh, Jason Henderson, I think, was talking about how money is flowing from the rest of the world into the U.S. as a safe haven. So how you reflect on that, that's been a significant trend here. And, and, and what does that mean for agriculture, do you think, and really for the state's economy and, as well? Well, I think foreign direct investment, again, it's enormously positive for the U.S. economy as a whole. The fact that investors around the world want to invest in America is a vote of confidence in our economy. And as imperfect as our democratic process is, it's also a vote of confidence in our overall democratic process and the rule of law. And that's why we have, you always hear about the dollar as the reserve currency. It's, it's because it's backed by the U.S. economy and investors are saying we have confidence in the U.S. economy. So that's enormously positive and we need to keep that. You know, people have asked me, well, when do we think there would be a competitor to the dollar, a credible competitor to the dollar? The two obvious candidates, the two other major economies in the world that would be obvious candidates, one would be Europe and the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're paying attention to the paper, they've got their own challenges, big challenges to sort out. And of course, China over time being a very large growing economy. But relative to Europe and China today, investors are saying, hey, we believe in the U.S. economy and as imperfect as the U.S. Yeah. political system is, we believe in that. So I think that's enormously positive and I hope that our own competitive position stays ahead of the rest of the world going forward. Sure. Yeah, and that's a, it actually ties in um, to wages as well. So there's been this long running story that we were shipping manufacturing offshore, going to other countries because wages were lower. Now, is, what, to what extent is our economy from, you know, part of its technology substituting for labor? You know, what's happening with that, that dynamic between innovation, you mentioned a little bit with China and their policies, you have an innovation component, you've got relative wages, you've got labor that shift those global dynamics. What are you seeing there? Well, one of the big questions that we are all wrestling with is it seems like there's tremendous technology that's being developed in our economy mm -hmm. and in the global economy. Yet if you look at the productivity measurements, it's not showing up in the productivity measurements. So there are a lot of different theories for why that might be. Some people say the stuff that we're inventing right now, say Twitter, no offense to everybody on Twitter and Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're basically leisure devices. They're not actually making us more productive. That's one idea. Another idea is that there is big innovation taking place, but it takes decades for it to work its way into the economy and really show up in productivity measurements. I know the ag sector is enormously innovative. And, you know, whether it's one of the reasons that prices are low is because farmers are so productive and are continuously setting new records for how uh, productive they become. So I think these are complex questions. Productivity tends to be a global phenomenon. So if we invent a great new technology in Minnesota, it can quickly be adopted around the world. And then the world's productivity tends to improve. So this is something that we're seeing all around the world, and it's still something we don't completely understand. Mm -hmm. So agriculture is kind of unique in that space, I think, because uh, obviously the land that we have in this area of the world, in fact, Minnesota, one of the unique things, we're on about the 46th parallel of, of the globe, and about 50% of the world's agricultural production occurs on that same parallel. Mm -hmm. But there are other places in the world, Brazil, Argentina, that as we shift some of these trade policies, um, you know, what are the influences, do you think, long term? The question, long term, we've, we're, we're changing the trade bargain, I guess, or, or deals. Have you given thought to how that shifts some of those dynamics in the world? Because, you know, those, some of these agreements have been in place for, you know, post-World War II, and we're making some pretty big shifts. Do you see... Big changes occurring or is it more margin around the edges and the most competitive space wins no matter what? My, my sense is, and you all are the experts in this better than I am, so let me just start there. My sense on these type of markets is in the long term, it ends up being who's most competitive. I think in the short run, there are going to be ups and downs. There are going to be shifts in the trade patterns. But if we, if the U.S. farmers and, and Minnesota farmers and ag producers are more competitive, they're going to win the market share. And that's one of the, nat that's the nature of... Uh, commodity markets that we are operating in. Now, I mean, ag is more complicated. It's not a pure commodity. It's not exactly steel. It's not exactly oil. I understand that. But at the end of the day, why has the U.S. been the leader in agriculture around the world for so long? Because we've been the most productive. And I don't see anything that's, I don't see any evidence that that's changing. I don't think our innovation edge is going to go away because of these tariffs. Yeah. So there's some good news in these trade. I mean, there's a solid basis there. It's the short term. Let's look to the long term and how we improve those. Yeah. 
and march forward with that technology. And you think yeah. about a, a parallel sector in the oil sector. So obviously oil prices are very volatile. When oil prices fell dramatically, it really affected North Dakota yeah. as an example. But we didn't forget how to innovate. It, it, it absolutely affected the people who were doing the work. It absolutely affected those businesses. But our brain power that developed this technology didn't all of a sudden go away yeah. and stop thinking and stop innovating. Right. We continued to lead the world in that technology development. Right. So good, I was talking far too much. So yeah. this is an interesting question too. So we mentioned President Trump. And I, I suspect- You, you I, mentioned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect this may be a question that you might not want to answer, but to what extent have President Trump's comments on low interest rates factored into Fed's decision making? I, I can tell you honestly, not at all. Uh, one of the things that's wonderful about the Federal Reserve System, and I wish you all could peer behind the curtain, that's why I come out to do these type of town halls, to let you see in as much as you can. The Federal Reserve as an institution is non-political, non-partisan. It's really people who are dedicated to serving the country and achieving the goals that Congress has given us in a non-political manner. So starting with our chairman, Jay Powell, and all of the presidents and the governors of the Federal Reserve System, everybody is committed to making decisions based on data and analysis, not based on political consideration. So my colleagues and I may have different, we may look at the data and draw somewhat different conclusions, that's healthy, yeah. but we're all doing it for the right reasons, which is let's make the best decisions we can based on the data. Yeah. Well, the follow-up to that, I think, which is probably informative for people, you know, what are the consequences of, we do have an independent Fed, you do make decisions based on the science of economics. Some people laugh about the science of economics, right? <laughs> so what is the consequence of that influence creeping in there? I mean, what, what, you know, what are the potential of that? We read about it a lot, but what's your thoughts on that? Of, I mean, I think if we had a different composition of people around the Federal Reserve system who were more focused on politics, then I think that if you look at other countries where the executive branch or the legislature is able to exert direct influence on monetary policy decision making, what ends up happening is people lose confidence in the currency. They lose confidence in the, um, the funding of the government, yeah. the treasury bonds that are out there, and that expresses itself in inflation taking off. And you can see it in other countries around the world where that's happened. Well, if you look at U.S. inflation expectations, they are rock solid anchored. You know, the U.S. Treasury is printing out record debt levels. And yet the Treasury bonds, let's say a 10-year Treasury, mm -hmm. right now is yielding around 3.15 or 3.2 percent, somewhere in that range. So Treasury rates are still very low. Why are Treasury rates so low? Because people have confidence in part, they're low because people have confidence that the Federal Reserve is independent and is going to make decisions based on data, not based on politics. And so if that were to be compromised, and I don't think it will be, if that were to be compromised, it would show up in higher inflation expectations and higher government borrowing costs. Mm -hmm. right. So the full faith and credit of the U.S. dollar yeah, is exactly. at stake, essentially. Yeah. Um, this goes a little bit back to the productivity question you had. Um, you know, Will the rest of the world close the gap? We may be seeing some of that already. Uh, you look at some of the investments that China has made in their own agricultural systems, dramatic changes over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. So what are your thoughts on the global gap that we've had historically? Is that closing? Well, we always see in all types of different innovation markets, you see laggards who are able to adopt fairly new technology and close a lot of the gap. So they can, they can demonstrate remarkable productivity because they're just catching up to where we are. So that's going to happen, and that's actually a good thing. The, the world economy is becoming more productive as people who are using you know, generate technology multiple generations ago start adopting modern practices. That's good for the global economy as a whole. But at the end of the day, who's going to be on the cutting edge? Yeah. On, whether it's ag or it's software or it's hardware or it's energy, I don't see anybody who's remotely positioned to out-innovate the United States of America. I've seen no evidence of that. Uh, and so I'm, you know, we need to keep investing in our universities. We need to keep investing in research and development. But I think we are best positioned to continue to lead that in that competition. Right. Um, in productivity, technology came up. You just mentioned it occurred to me. We were talking about wages earlier. So one of the challenges in agriculture, while we have been tremendously technologically advancing, and of course one of the issues is we see people then leave agriculture to move into other sectors of the economy. And we're in an interesting place now, and I think in agriculture you've probably seen the, um, the autonomous tractors, for example. Mm -hmm. 
and some of the automation robotics, and this hasn't come up today yet, I don't think, in this conversation. So you've got this a bit of, in agriculture now, and necessity is the mother of invention. So we've got the technology advancements. We have kind of a labor crunch we hear about here. Where do you see, you know, will robots take over agriculture? You know, where does that dynamic fit between wages, technology innovation in ag? What's your sense of, and that's across the economy, really. That's not just agriculture. Yeah, it's across the economy. So one of the other explanations for why productivity growth has been low in recent years, and we don't know how much of this is true, is when the Great Recession hit and unemployment in the nation spiked to 10%, there was a lot of labor available. So businesses could say, you know what, I don't need to invest in this new machine. I can just go hire a few more people to do the job. And now as labor gets tighter and more scarce, businesses, including ag, are saying, you know what, it's harder for me to find workers. Maybe I will go invest in that technology. So I think that this trade-off between technology and labor has been happening forever. I mean, certainly when, if you go back 100 years or 150 years ago, when ag was incredibly labor intensive, and then automation came back then, mm -hmm. and people said, well, that's the end of labor. What's gonna happen to all these workers? Well, they moved into factories, they moved into cities, and they did different jobs. So I think that this dynamism of the global economy and the US economy has been with us for a long time, mm -hmm. and I think it's gonna be with us for a long time. I don't think it predicts the end of labor. I think the nature of jobs is changing. Yeah. So yes, does anybody out there have, I, I want to ask this question, you know, uh, what are you seeing as you're facing, we hear, and I guess I could almost turn into the, you know, between immigration questions, Minnesota, if you look at rural communities in Minnesota, so particularly the Wilmers, uh, the major centers, Marshalls, uh, and you look at population demographics, you'll feel, see a fairly significant, there's more diversity in those communities in terms of um, origin. So a lot of, from Latin America, of course, um, other parts of the world, from Eastern Europe to yeah. Africa, in 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 work there, um, that's that's really changing the face of rural communities as well. And I'm curious for people in the audience, you know, what do you see happening with quality of labor, labor availability in some of these regions where we do have significant manufacturing, processing, investments there, and what are people doing to address that? You know, are you investing in new technologies? Are you making those types of decisions now? I think that's the kind of thing you were asking people to respond to. But in the meantime, your sense of, there's the immigration question in that a little bit. Sure. A little bit of rural communities and what impact labor has on them. Well, um, when I travel around our region, as you, as you all know, our region is very rural. And most rural communities I go to, people say, we're really worried about the future of our communities because our young people are leaving. Our young people go away to college and maybe they stay and they don't come back, and what's gonna to happen to our towns? And there are a handful of towns that have really turned to immigration to try to change the dynamics, the growth dynamics. And so uh, I've been going around, we, in fact, we had a conference earlier this week at the Minneapolis Fed on immigration's role in our regional economy, both to meet the needs of the workforce, so businesses and farmers who need workers, and if you think about what happens to the future of many of these towns that are declining population, immigration has a very important role to play. I mean, this is, this is math. So I'm gonna leave it to all of you to decide on whether you like immigration or not, but I'm just gonna do the math for you. One important source of economic growth is simply population growth. And we all are having fewer kids than we had 30 years ago or 50 years ago. So your choices are you can accept slower growth, you can try to subsidize fertility, and usually people laugh when I say it, but Japan is trying. You can give tax credits and childcare to encourage families to have more kids. By the way, it takes 20 years to grow a new worker. Just want to point that out. Or number three, <laughs> or number three, you can embrace immigration. And that's math. And so we as a country need to recognize the reality of that math and whether or not we want strong growth over the long term. I'll tell you, 3% GDP growth it, long term, 3% GDP growth is very hard to deliver unless we do something about our demographics. You can do it in the short run with fiscal stimulus. We know how to do that. But you can't do it over a decade, year on year, if you don't do something about our demographics. And that's math. Yeah. Great. Well, I take it we, we do have some notes on here, but we must have a bunch of millennials in the, off in the, in the audience. They won't uh, step up and go to the mic. But I'll, I'll ask the question, this follow on to this, it looks like in rural Minnesota. Um, not convinced higher wages will convince urban workers to come out to greater Minnesota. 
Do we need to have some sort of a, a reverse move from the, the, you know, the traditional view in agriculture was you, you do bring kids from the farm, I myself and one else from a farm into a city somewhere. Are there some things we should think about with regard to how do we start to, um, you know, it, it, it could be, you know, the, the amenities of, of rural communities, roads, transportation, uh, internet access, yeah. what are the kinds of things we might do to start to um, convince people that rural areas are a great place to live? Well, I'm, I am seeing some towns who are much more aggressive on this front. So some small communities are actively saying we want to improve the amenities so that when our young people leave, they want to come back when it's time to start a family. And you do see people doing the round trip you know, successfully. So there needs to be amenities is one. There need to be jobs for them to be able to do, to use the skills that they've gained in whatever their job or their profession is. Things like internet access. I mean, these are... They seem simple, but they're not simple for a lot of rural communities to be able to deliver on these things. So there are things that rural communities, some communities are doing a better job of and having some success. But the, at the end of the day, I think the most powerful signal is wages. Yeah. You know, it's funny. When, wherever I go, people tell me, oh my gosh, we have a welder shortage. We just cannot find enough skilled welders. So when I go to community colleges, and I visit a bunch of them around our region, I will usually, I get a tour of the college, mm -hmm. and I'll take the president of the community college, and I'll say, hey, you need to train more welders. What's the matter with you? And they've said to me, a few college presidents have said, you know, we've tried. We expanded our welding program, we hired more teachers, we built more labs, and we got no more students. And that tells me there's not a welder shortage. The wages for welders need to go up. And if the wages for welders go up, guess what? People will say, hey, that's a good career. I'm going to go into that. I'm going to go get trained, and I'm going to be a welder. So if uh, as farmers become increasingly technology savvy, my guess is you know, some of the uh, hand labor is going to continue to disappear, and you're going to need people with higher and higher skills, fewer people, but higher and higher skills. And as those wages go up, you're going to be able to attract people to come to take them. That's a great point. Leads to wages and inflation conversation you had earlier. Yeah, you potentially, know, but, it, but, it, but, it, but productivity is the, is the, the, the medium, so yeah, to speak, yeah, right? Great. So um, a, a, a question here about, do you have an ag advisory committee at the Fed? Uh, just a pretty straightforward question. We have different advisory committees, some of whom are made up of uh, ag lenders, some of whom are directly representing the ag community. So we have different mediums of getting feedback to us. We also have regional economists. One of our uh, economists, Joe Mann, is here today who focuses on the ag sector. And then, so he's out and about. And then when I travel around our region, I actively make, make sure that I'm meeting with people from the ag community to hear directly what's happening. You know, this is a huge region. Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, et cetera. There's no one ag uh, sector in that region. Right, there are huge regional differences. There are weather differences within that region, in addition to different commodities that yeah. we're actually producing. Yeah, some would say in January the weather conditions are pretty similar, but you know, <laughs> certain times of the year. But some places in our district, you know, it's drought. In other yeah. pa places, it's too much rain. Uh, you know, and this is in one in one Federal Reserve district. Yeah. So I, I like this question about steel. So in this, it goes a little bit to trade again. We're seeing steel, steel and aluminum come in agriculture, whether it's manufacturing or you know, farm equipment, you name it, a lot of steel and aluminum goes into agriculture. Yes. You know, what's your sense of that in terms of uh, where that's heading to and what impact it might have on ag, and what does it do for manufacturing? We have a heavy manufacturing base here in Minnesota. Yeah, no, at manufacturing, I mean, one of the things that's really great about our Minnesota economy and our regional economy is that it's very diverse. Most major sectors of the U.S. economy are represented here, and that's really a source of strength because if ag is suffering, there's a chance the other sectors are doing better and they can balance each other. But you're right, we do have a lot of manufacturing here and we are exposed to that. So this is where I think the best hope for all of us is that there can be some resolution to these trade battles that are taking place right now that soon. Like, I don't think this uncertainty or elevated tariffs is going to serve us well over the long term. We need to get to a fair trade and we need to get to trade certainty as soon as we possibly can. The longer this goes on, it is going to be painful for the ag sector and for the other sectors that are directly exposed to it. Just to follow that, we mentioned getting to get to a fair trade. What do you, what do you, what's your sense of China's strategy in this right now? So the U.S. kind of fired the first volley in a way. 
What do you think their strategy? Do they, do they recognize some of these, uh, you know, obviously it seems, or people have at least claimed that part of the strategy was to hit agriculture a little bit with some of their trade. You know, do you see that, that continuing on, that retaliatory, that's the classic trade war phenomenon, or? It seems like it. Now, the big question is, so China's economy, we know that China's economy is much more trade dependent than is our economy. I know for folks in the room, trade is enormously important, and it is to the US, but as a share of our economy, trade is much smaller, a much smaller share of the US economy than it is for China. So that would imply that dollar for dollar, or renminbi for renminbi, they have a little bit more to lose in the short run than we do, mm -hmm. a, little more, a little more risk. So then the question is the political dynamics, which is, does China and their, you know, they do not, they're not a democracy. So can they endure pain? Can their political system endure pain longer yeah. than our political system can endure pain? And that I don't know. There's so far, if you look at the, the national statistics for the US economy, the tariffs are having almost no effect. They're having an effect on farmers, they're having an effect on the ag sector. But if you add up all the sectors of the US economy, the tariffs are not really showing up in any meaningful way yet. We think they are showing up for China. So it does seem like China is feeling more pain right now. But it might be that their political system allows them to have a higher pain tolerance for longer than we have. And I don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah. That's really interesting. There's, there's a couple of people here, of course, interest. You get plenty of questions about. And all of them are long range looking at interest rates. One looking back to the 70s and 80s and what that did to land values. One asking about what the next three to five years are. I think uh, Howard Buffett wrote a book called 40 Years and the notion of that was um, 40, most farmers have 40 years of their, their investment and work in this. Uh, I think, uh, Chris, you said 32 years, so she's getting close to 40 years. Um, so what are, what, are, what are the longer term, what do you see happening with interest rates? And the Fed's kind of walking this line, wage, inflation, you know, where does that move and over the longer run? And what, what does that mean for land values? Well, over the last 30 years or so, one thing that we've seen is that interest rates in advanced economies have gradually declined. So interest rates now, the notion of what interest rate is neutral, what interest rate neither stimulates the economy nor taps the brakes. I think we're pretty close to neutral today, and that's a lot lower than where neutral was 20 or 30 years ago. So what determines that? Well, what we think determines that are things like productivity growth, things like demographics, some of these broader macroeconomic forces wrapped together in determining the overall supply and demand of capital. And that ultimately determines where neutral is. So right now, you know, it's very hard to say where interest rates gonna be in 30 or 40 years. I basically have no idea because I don't really know what's gonna be happening to productivity. You know, if there's great new inventions that require a lot of capital and that are very productive. You could imagine huge demand for capital all around the world, but it's going to be very productive to make those investments and the neutral interest rate will be higher than it is today. So these are the broad macro forces that, that affect us, but that we don't really have direct influence over. So over the next few years, the outlook for inflation is contained. The U.S. economy looks strong. I feel more confident in that. What's going to happen 20 years from now or 30 years from now? Boy, we just don't know. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, this conversation 10 years ago, we were talking about deflationary. When you were managing TARP, yep. that was the concern. Uh, we have not done a whole lot to reduce sovereign debt around the world. And a couple of people have asked this question in here. That's why I'm raising it now, I guess. Um, what do you see as the risk size? So in the U.S., in fact, I guess the estimate, I, if I recall, is about a trillion dollars from the the tax relief program. Yeah, 1.8, something like that. Yeah. yeah. What, what, is, what is the, what do you see as the risk of, there was an earlier slide today about housing markets and where they're at relative to wage increases, for example. What is the risk of debt out there? What does that do to inflation, deflation, that tipping point? Well, you uh, would expect, so we know no country can afford to print debt forever. You can't live beyond your means. At some point, investors around the world say, you know what, I'm losing confidence in your economy that you're gonna pay this debt back, and there's someplace else I wanna go invest in. So it's, it's somewhat of a relative game. So you could imagine, imagine if Europe gets their political house in order, and now investors around the world say, you know what, I'm gonna go invest in Europe as a better place to invest in America. Then all of a sudden, our debt capacity relatively gets reduced. Now, the question is, we don't know when that's gonna happen. We don't know, 
Are we five years away from that happening or 20 years away? We don't know. Right now, if you look at the data, investors around the world are saying we have a lot of confidence in the U.S. economy and the U.S. economic system, including our legal system and our political system, and we're, that we feel good about that. But at what point is that going to change? And again, it's partly a relative measure. It's not just up to us. It's also up to other countries when they make their economies relatively more attractive places to invest. So that's why it is important that we make tough choices to live within our means, to get our fiscal house in order while we still have time. We certainly don't want to be in a position of being forced to do it because investors have already decided, hey, we've lost confidence in America. We're going to go invest in Europe or we're going to go invest in China. That's going to be a much more painful adjustment for us to make than to make it when we are the more attractive economy. So somebody's got my interest at heart here, it looks like, um, with a question about education. And I'm going to broaden out from here. It's talking about higher education. But as you look at uh, the U.S. economy in general and rural economies, historically one of the great uh, differentiators for the U.S. has been really strong both from all the way from K-12. We have some FFA students here today, all the way from K-12 on through higher education. And now we have these elements of what's the cost of higher education or investing sufficiently in, edu in all education. And what we're observing uh, within that, so this is a multi-part question, I can't stand to ask just one question. Okay. There's sort of these, these achievement gaps that we hear a lot about. And if you uh, look at um, you know, classroom availability, the distance to get to your schools in rural communities where you have consult, you know, what, what do we do about education? What are some of the issues you see there going forward? Um, and your thoughts on what we can do to maybe uh, influence that? Yeah. Uh, it's enormously important. So you're exactly right that one of our competitive edges, our advantages in the past century was that our population was by and large far more educated than competitive nations around the world. And the rest of the world, frankly, is catching up. Now, you can't do it forever, right? You can't just continuously provide five or 10 years more education to all of your population in an arms race because eventually people got to work, right? You can't be in school forever. So it's a good thing in some sense that other nations are also investing in education, but our source of advantage is also diminishing. And there are these huge gaps that you just talked about, which are a huge problem for us. So at the Minneapolis Fed, we've launched a major new research institute focused on understanding why these gaps exist, why they're so per persistent, and what we can do to close it. So I, I wish I had a silver, a silver bullet, an answer, but we know we have to be able to provide a high quality education to all of our young people. We have to give all of our young people in rural Minnesota, in the cities, high quality education, great access, and open doors for them. Mm -hmm. Education is the great equalizer. You know, I feel like I am proof of what is possible in our country if you get a good education. My parents came here from India. Uh, we were middle class, but I had a big advantage because my parents were highly educated. They insisted that I got a good education because I got a good education, every door has been open to me. So we got to provide that to all of our young people in Minnesota and in around our country. And that means things like technology. There's a lot of innovation happening in online learning. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to replace all classrooms, but it is showing promise. And our access to affordability to higher education uh, is also critical. It cannot simply be that we force every student to take on more and more debt. That is not a solution. It is, it is at best a Band-Aid. It's not a long-term viable strategy. Um, you know, to kind of jump a little bit here, uh, we haven't talked about exchange rates. Uh, you're, you kind of stepped around those a little bit. Um, this question is more about what about countries who don't have Federal Reserve Banks? And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it, we're seeing a little bit of this in Brazil right now, some, some again, of the some flaky monetary policy perhaps going on, put it that way. What's your, what does that do to our competitive realm? I mean, in, in, I'll even take this to the point where at one point there was talk about not having the U.S. being the currency, the global currency. Um, so what, what, what do you see happening there? Um, well, this goes back to the notion of people having confidence in the U.S. economy, confidence in the dollar, confidence in our economic system, and confidence, frankly, that the Federal Reserve is going to make decisions based on economic reasons not based on political reasons. And so there are many examples around the world where politicians find it very uh, attractive in the short term to tell their central banks, hey, you keep rates low because it's going to be good for the economy in the short run. And the central bank acquiesces 
and then that is good for the economy in the short run, but then that leads to an overstimulating of the economy, which leads to inflation, and then people lose confidence in the economy. So it's a short-term win, but long-term it actually puts the economy at a big-time disadvantage. And so obviously we have to avoid that, and that's why I think the Federal Reserve is well positioned to keep doing our jobs, because everyone across the Federal Reserve system is committed to making decisions based on economic data, not based on political considerations. So, um, we're, 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 I'm going off the screen, so just jump sure. a little bit for you. Hopefully, you see how quickly you can change your mindset here. Okay. But a lot of conversation about technology. Um, one of the issues that comes in, that's coming in here now, is the sustainability question, sustainability and, and, and stewardship, and the role that technology plays in that. But also the tread. It's it's almost that classic technology treadmill case. There's so much. This this has a bit of a tone to it of. Um, you know, there's a lot of push and a lot of need to keep on that treadmill, keep moving and advancing forward with technology innovation and stewardship all at the same time. You know, does that ever stop? Is that sort of the nature of the global world we're in with these technologies? Or are there ways to, you know, enable people to, to think more broadly about how do we think about, not that they're mutually exclusive, but where does that fit together? Because a lot of the ecosystem values I think they're getting to with uh, services in land and, you know, what does that... I think, it's a, I think it's always going to be a challenge to find the right balance. It's always going to be a struggle, both, both as individuals. How much do we let technology you know, run our daily lives? Uh, how much do we get absorbed by social media, as an example, but also in our businesses? And how much are you going to invest in technology in the latest thing versus focusing on sustainability? And hopefully technology can enable sustainability and make us more effective in achieving high productivity, high output, but also in a sustainable manner. Yeah. That's, that's, the, right, that's the right balance that I think we all aim to strive for. All right. So we've talked a lot about um, changes in ag. I know one of the issues, and we've talked a lot about labor here, and I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet, but what, what about healthcare in, in, in this region? We're, in fact, just a couple days ago, I think we saw Mayo um, got a $200 million investment there. We hear a lot about, you know, we have the, the best medical care in the world if you can afford it kind of things. Um, rural communities, of course, access to physicians. We're seeing shortages of physicians, dentists, you name it, across health professions. Um, you know, does the, does the Fed have a role in engaging that conversation? And how do we start to solve? That was obviously a big part of the, the campaign was around health care. What are your thoughts on, on both big picture and I think really focused on rural communities and farmers who a lot of health care comes through. Uh, uh, if you're in a company, a large company, I'm at the right. University of Minnesota, we have health care programs. If you're an individual, that market's quite different. Yep. Address some of those questions. Well, there. these are uh, big, complicated questions that, that there are no simple answers for. You know, we had a, a Harvard professor at the Minneapolis Fed visiting us a, f a month or so ago, presenting on this very point. And he, he noted, it's very interesting, he said that Minnesota has some of the best health outcomes at the lowest cost relative to some other states that spend, I think he said it compared Minnesota to Florida, they spend 2x per capita for similar health outcomes. So Minnesota actually, if you look at the data, has a lot going for us. But again, it's not available to everybody, but we're doing better than some other places around the country. So one thing that I noticed, I was visiting South Dakota, and I can't remember if it was Sioux Falls, but they had a big telemedicine tele uh, presence where they have teams of doctors that I visited, and they beam their doctors, their specialists, into rural communities around the country. So their model that they were adopting was a rural community might have a general practitioner or a nurse practitioner, and then for, if they needed a specialist, they would go by video to the specialist in South Dakota who would walk the nurse practitioner or the general practitioner through how to treat this patient yeah. and then determine, hey, do we need to send this patient to a major medical center or can we do this remotely? That was one example of technology trying to help close some of these gaps that we know are, are there and are re real and are serious. So again, I don't think we have an easy answer for this. Yeah. I think it's going to continue to be a challenge, but it is promising that technology might have a role to play mm -hmm. in closing some of these gaps. Yeah. I'd like to have you see it have a lot, lot more answers here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it's a complicated well, professor, questions. Uh, yeah, okay, I can turn to you yeah, too. Heal thyself. I hear that yeah. in the healthcare question, right? Um, so there's a question about the economy, and we talk about monetary. In fact, you know, you're here, so we're going to talk monetary. But actually, I'm going to widen that out for a little bit. And okay. it's actually, I never thought of it before, but a little bit of a rebuttal to we've got fiscal, we've got monetary. 
We've got the federal government passing budgets and, and what they do with tax policy and so on. This question is about moving beyond the 2% growth mark uh, for the growth of the economy. Monetary policy is part of that. Be interested your comments about, uh, it's almost a, a, a reverse order of that. What's happening, do you think, with tax policies and how are those affecting growth and what's the potential there? And that ties, I suppose, a little bit to the debt question too, but yeah. it's, can, it's we, really, can we increase growth? It's really too soon to know what the effect is on the tax cut from last year. And so there's two, there's two schools of thought that I'll lay out for you. One school of thought says, this is just a sugar high. That, you know, if you spend more, you're gonna get more GDP growth in the short run, but eventually that extra spending wears off and you return back to your traditional, your prior growth rate. That's one school of thought that the tax cut is not gonna lead to higher long-term growth. The other school of thought is, well, maybe it's gonna lead to a lot more investment and that investment is gonna lead to more productivity and that's gonna improve the long-term growth rate of the US economy. From my perspective, I think the jury is still out. We just don't know yet. I meet with a lot of businesses and I ask them, have you increased your investment because of the tax cut? So far, you're not seeing, you're seeing some uptick in investment in the early part of this year. It seems to have dropped off in th the third quarter. Is it gonna pick back up again? I don't know. You are seeing a lot of companies that are buying back their stock. Well, that's not a signal of increasing investment. That's a signal of returning capital to shareholders. So I think the jury is still out. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that long term, long term, let me just go back to the fundamental principles. Where does long term economic growth come from? It comes from increasing labor, so more workers to produce things and more consumers to buy things, and it comes from productivity growth. It does not come from uh, increased budgets, deficits forever, because you can't do it forever. And it does not come from monetary policy. It comes from more productivity and more workers. And we know we have fewer workers going forward just because our fertility rates are down. So we need to do something about that. And somehow we need to keep productivity up. The question, there's a little question on that about, you know, can we continue that productivity treadmill for, I mean, what's that, that cycle? But um, I'll, I'll, I'll move to the, to the next one, I think. Underlying concerns about the Chinese economy, we broaden that out to the global economy because we are seeing some weakness in other places. Uh, what, what's your projection around the rest of the world and their ability to, to lift, uh, lift the overall? I'll tell you, the global economy is, I mean, as hard as the U.S. economy is to predict, predicting the global economy is also very, very difficult. And so I think we're somewhat surprised that the global economy has, seems to be slowing right now. Is it just a temporary headwind or is it something longer term? We don't know. We do know that U.S. monetary policy does have an effect on the world. So when we tend to raise rates, this emerging markets often can be somewhat exposed to the U.S. economy raising rates. So when we set U.S. monetary policy, we try to set the optimal policy for America. We're not setting it for the world. But we do pay attention to what's happening around the world as a feedback loop back on the U.S. economy. So we do care what happens to the world because it can affect the U.S. economy. So right now, the U.S. economy seems to be the strongest engine of the major economies around the world. Is that going to last, especially if, you, if the Fed keeps raising rates? You know, it's hard to know. Yeah. So are you, is there any, you know, a lot lately has been made of, uh, so the EU, uh, we're seeing a, a breaking of the EU, but Brexit's coming up and going to be executed on. We're seeing other countries moving beyond that sort of since we just, I guess, uh, recognized the, the close of World War I, a 100-year anniversary of that. You know, what do you see happening with that? You know, some of the, the, it's part of the trade dynamic that countries are choosing to somewhat, you know, break away from those long-term trade agreements. What, how do you see that playing out in the, in the global economy? That, that's a real shift over the last 40 years from where things have been. Well, Europe is, uh, is related but different a little bit to the trade discussion in the sense. So Europe, when they adopted the common currency, they said, we're gonna have one monetary policy for the Eurozone, that's set by the European Central Bank, but they didn't harmonize the rest of the country, the rest of the economies. So in the US, we have one monetary policy, we have one dollar, you can live anywhere you want in the US, there's free flow of trade between the states, free flow of services, it truly is a national economy. Well, and, and there, we have one fiscal government, right? The US government taxes all of us, and then they issue bonds on behalf of all of us, on all of us, and then they spend on behalf of all of us. Well, Europe hasn't gone that far yet. Europe has the common currency, but they have not yet harmonized all of their different 
fiscal situations across the various states. So that's created tensions between, let's say, Germany and Italy, or Germany and Greece, et cetera. So that's a, a fundamental tension that they need to find a way to reconcile in the Eurozone. And these things can take time, right? As I mentioned at the start, Alexander Hamilton created the first bank of the United States. It lasted about 20 years. Then they created another one. Then Andrew Jackson killed that one off. And then in 1907, there was a banking panic, and Congress responded by creating the Federal Reserve in 1913. The reason I'm giving you that history is some of these dem democratic processes take a long time to sort out. And is Europe going to take five years or 20 years or longer to sort all this out? I don't know. So we're getting near the end of our time, and I would like to hear, um, you know, so, you know, what do you see, what would you like um, to tell the President of the Federal Reserve Bank that um, you think uh, they should be focusing on or that we haven't talked about? Looks like there's a question back uh, to the right. Uh, yeah, it might not be related to, if you wanted to go someplace else, go ahead, I'm not sure. I had a question related back to uh, earlier conversations. Um, and, and both of you might have a perspective on this, but we had a conversation this morning about intellectual property. And um, Neil, you've mentioned a number of times about how the rest of the world benefits from our innovation. So how important is it for there to be a return to innovation in terms of, you know, intellectual property that's developed, um, you know, and, and gets stolen by other countries and, and used against us in some way for competition. You know, the earliest, if my 55-year-old <clears throat> mind can remember what I learned 40 years ago, the earliest um, example that I can think of is Eli Whitney's carrying the uh, um, designs for a cotton gym across, across the Atlantic, you know, and using that to great advantage for the U.S., right? You know, so um, China does a lot of things like that to us. Um, is that important that we stop that stealing of intellectual capital or is that insignificant in terms of our ability to continue to be innovative, innovative leaders? I mean, I, I think it's enormously important. At the end of the day, you all invest in your businesses to get a return. And I think it's enormously important that the U.S. find a way to enforce our intellectual property protections in markets around the world. Now, the optimists will say China is investing a lot of money in their education system and in R&D, and that when they start developing technologies of their own, it's going to be in their own interest to protect them. So they're going to have to develop intellectual property protections for their own innovations, which will then benefit us and our innovations. Now, I hope that's true, but at the baseline, it is enormously important, and I think the fundamental political conflict that we're having with China around trade, more than anything else, is about intellectual property protection and the ability to access their markets while still protecting our innovation. So my opinion is it's enormously important. He asked me to add to that. Please. So it's, an inter it's a really interesting dynamic question because that's from the producer side of the equation, right? That you protect that IP, you spur innovation, there's more innovation, that treadmill that's there. The question is at what point always does IP become a protectionist strategy in itself? that you don't induce innovation because what, and the example I'll use, and it's probably controversial, it comes up quite a bit now, is a pharmaceutical industry, where you get into, you know, taking long-term patents on drugs, oftentimes broadly that restrict other development in other areas, and you reduce innovation to the cost of the consumer. So often these conversations go very much into this producer side of this, which is what the trade issue is, of course, I recognize that. It's always been this kind of controversial thing with e economics. What's the right level of protection? Sure, for because, how long? yeah, for how long? And so it is, it's not as simple as saying, because there is a theory too that you just have open, open technology, in which case the innovation treadmill speeds up so fast, and then the competitive game becomes first to market. Can you be on that place to move the next, the next treadmill to market? So it's a really interesting question. I think, like so many, I didn't give an answer either. I wanted to make sure we, we have four hands up here now. So we got a lot of other hands. <laughs> so, but tough question. Other question. Let's saw somebody else either. So one I've been wondering about. Just this may be we're getting near the end here, but it hasn't come up today either. But 
the Minneapolis Fed is, uh, has been recognized for a long time as the, I think, uh, Gary Stern and um, uh, Ron Feldman, I think, mm -hmm. wrote the Too Big to Fail. Re with regard to banking sector, we're seeing, again, a lot of uh, both in ag finance credit, look at it from that perspective, look at it in just size of scales of firms and ownership in, in, in agriculture and food systems. Is there such a thing, you know, what do you see as that in, in an ag context, I guess, from a, from a finance perspective? I also think on a smaller scale that we've got some very large farms out there in Minnesota now. They're typically privately held, financed by debt and equity. Uh, there's gonna be some transition there, people on average age a year every 12 months kind of a thing. So how do we, you know, what does that credit market look like in ag? Because uh, is too big to fail a thing there, or is it, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, we are seeing, obviously, concerns from ag lenders. The longer the low ag prices continue, the more exposure, the uptick in bankruptcies and whatnot. So I think the ag sector, you all know better than I, I do, is under pressure. And if this continues, we'll continue being under pressure. You know, I certainly hope too big to fail is not a thing in the ag sector. It's not a good thing for the U.S. economy if we have firms that if they fail, they bring down the rest of the U.S. economy. That's nothing to aspire to. Uh, and so, you know, I've been of the view with my colleague Ron Feldman that the biggest banks in America, the giant banks, need a lot more capital, equity capital, to make sure that they have the buffer to withstand downturns and mistakes. But our basic capitalist system is, if a firm runs into trouble, it should be able to go through bankruptcy. And ownership may change. The operations can continue. Ownership changes and the rest of the U.S. economy is largely unaffected. So, I mean, again, I'm not wishing that on anybody, but that's where I, yeah. I would sense the ag sector yeah. is. Good. Well, I think so we're getting our, yeah. our, uh, Good. our nook, our hook. Well, President so. Kashkari, it's thank been you a delight for to me. meet really you. And visit with you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, some complicated questions. Thank you very Just much, I appreciate it. Thank you.